Okay, good afternoon. We are gonna Oh, thank you. You are awake. That's exciting because honestly, I am a little sleepy. I ate too much and I had a lot of fun uh, uh, walking around the park and, and talking to people that uh, I think I, I uh, took up a lot of energy. Anyway, so as Dan said, uh, we are going to uh, talk about two more factors to consider and if you uh, if you didn't think it was too complicated, uh, since we already talked about multiple uses of landscapes, as we saw today and we saw yesterday, multiple uses of landscapes, uh, we are trying to, to uh, conserve biodiversity, but we also need to provide for uh, uh, local uh, communities. Um, if you didn't think human population growth was difficult, f uh, funding limitations were difficult, climate change, addressing climate change uh, issues, uh, if you didn't think this was enough to make conservation uh, a big headache. Uh, we are going to add two more uh, to make it even more uh, more challenging and more complex. Okay, so uh, just to make us think a bit about how we um, how we do conservation uh, when we, uh, especially when we are interested in the uh, the threats that are. Um, perceived as possible for a population, for a set of species, for an ecosystem, for a habitat, habitat, so on and so forth. Um, so when we try to figure out what are the problems um, and what kind of solutions we could provide, we have, we do these threat analyses uh, which are based either on experiments, well, they're based on experiments or observational studies or models or a combination of the three. So experiments meaning we, we try to learn more about the biology of the system we are studying or the species we are studying. Um, observational studies, of course, we just go in the field and take uh, observational data and try to uh, analyze that observational data and, and understand what the problems are and, and come up with some uh, possible solutions. And then models, we saw uh, models being used in the past or uh, we saw them as examples of of tools and methods to use in conservation biology. When we cannot do experiments, we have limited amount of observational data, then we rely on models. And a lot of times, we, like I said, we uh, combine the three if we have information from, uh, from these three different angles. Okay, so just to broadly think about how we identify uh, problems uh, and how we uh, come up or try to find solutions for these uh, uh, for these problems, for these uh, threat analyses. Okay, so as I said, we have not discussed two factors, uh, at least not in detail. Maybe we have mentioned invasive species and, and uh, land use change uh, for sure. Land use change we talked about, uh, but, but maybe not so much about invasive species. So um, by invasive species, just to make sure we all have the same vocabulary, we all speak the same language, we mean species that are introduced. And then we have all kinds of other uh, 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 terms that we use. For example, non-native, non-indigenous, alien, exotic. All trying to, to say the same thing, that these species are not originally from a certain area that we uh, find them. So we call them introduced, but there are all these other uh, terms that all these other words that basically uh, try to say the same, same thing or mean the same thing. Then we also have something else uh, or another uh, term, um, naturalized uh, species. And by that we mean species that have not, that originally uh, did not occur in a region, but, but they were introduced a long time ago and now they are so uh, well established <coughs> that we consider them part of the ecosystem. And I can give you plenty of examples from Europe and North America. Unfortunately, I'm not familiar with the uh, um, uh, invasive species on the African continent. So. Sorry about that, uh, but think of species that were not originally uh, present in a region and over a long period of, of time, they just become part of the ecosystem, they become uh, naturalized. Um, now, we may be asking ourselves, let's say we find an invasive, uh, an introduced species, the differences in terminology, uh, let's say we find an introduced species in a protected area, um, should, be, should we be uh, worried, should we be uh, concerned, should we take actions? And that depends on um, 
which species or when are species more likely that are species that are introduced are more likely to su succeed. And so far, the theory uh, or the uh, the data out there shows that uh, disturbed areas, areas that have high nutrient availability, and areas that have low biodiversity or low uh, species uh, richness tend to be more um, likely to uh, to be invaded or to have uh, non-native species, these introduced species established. If you think about disturbances, that means um, there is opportunity for um, for uh, establishment of different uh, different species because we we don't have a very um, we don't have a system at equilibrium. We have uh, disturbances disturbances occurring. Some species maybe. Uh, doing poorly than other, uh, so allowing for new species to uh, to get established. High, uh, higher nutrient availability, it means basically we are lowering the competition for, for nutrients, so there is more nutrients uh, uh, in the environment in that particular system. There, there are more opportunities, more chances for for uh, other species to be to get established because there, there, there are nutrients available for more species. And then this, uh, this last bit with about low biodiversity, this is, um, I would call it a hypothesis that um, systems that have low uh, uh, species richness uh, are more vulnerable to, uh, to invasions. But um, th these are three of the working hypotheses. So we have, um, the first one is natural enemy release hypothesis, which states that uh, a species that is taken from its uh, from its known uh, native ecosystem with its evolutionary uh, long evolutionary trajectory and established uh, interactions species interactions once that species is moved from that uh, from that natural setting into a new setting uh, that species become becomes free of of uh, competition free of diseases or less likely because it's introduced into a new system and those interactions are not yet established. So this is what natural enemy release hypothesis means. It means we are moving a species into a new uh, ecosystem, a new region, and we are uh, giving an advantage to that species because we are removing possible comp uh, competition uh, interactions that may be limiting that species in the natural uh, ecosystem or we are eliminating uh, diseases that may be uh, affecting that species in the natural system. Now the next two, you see biotic resistance hy hypothesis and biotic acceptance, acceptance hypothesis. These two go against each other. So one basically says, if we have a high species richness, a high, uh, yes, species richness or a high biodiversity system, that will give resistance to the system, resistance to, uh, um, to invasions for that system. And then the other one says that it actually allows for species to establish because the uh, high uh, interaction, the high, um, or the, yeah, the increased biodiversity present on the site uh, creates competition, competitive um, interactions between uh, the native species. So an invasive species is somehow in advantage because it has it's a novel species that has, does not have uh, interactions with, uh, readily, readily established with the, uh, with the other species. So these two are saying different things at this point. So we have evidence for all three. We don't have a unified uh, theory of, uh, of invasion, uh, but these three so far we have, we have um, uh, evidence for all three. So this is just a little bit of theory, how we think about invasive species um, and what kind of theory sh uh, we should have in mind when we are faced with uh, an introduced species in an area that is of conservation interest. Uh, and then I couldn't pass the chance of show showing some uh, famous examples of invasive species, the brown tree snake, uh, the cane toad. Look how happy the little girl is hugging this giant toad. Uh, and then uh, mongoose, this is one, one example, of sm uh, the small Indian uh, mongoose uh, introduced to the uh, Caribbean islands that, and that introdu introduction has generated um, extinction of several um, um, amphibian and reptile species. So, and I forgot to mention this has generated, this, this 
reduce the diversity of, of uh, species uh, quite, quite dramatically on uh, Guam Island. Anyways, and this is in Australia, a major introduction in Australia. But these are famous examples. There are thousands and <laughs> we can come up with thousands of examples of invasive species, introduced species that have, maybe not thousands that have generated local extinctions, but at least uh, uh, many, many species that have been moved around the uh, world uh, on different continents. Th these are just the famous ones that uh, tend to be reported uh, quite often. So why should we care? Besides the fact that biologically it makes for an interesting system to study, we have novel, uh, um, maybe we have novel interactions between species, uh, we can talk about dispersal, biogeography, all that. But from a conservation standpoint, why should we care about this? Well, one, one idea is this uh, idea of biotic homogenization. So what, what this uh, means, this concept uh, is um, encapsulating is the, the fact that by moving species around and accidentally or uh, intentionally introducing species to a new uh, region, we are uh, making the uh, species makeup uh, more uh, homogeneous. So we are removing the, um, the differences between different systems because we are moving around species either, uh, like I said, accidentally or intentionally. Uh, one uh, example that is, I think, clearly it illustrates this biotic homo homogenization concept is from, um, from an analysis of uh, fish communities in the United States. And you cannot read this table from the back, way in the back. So uh, I will summarize it for you uh, quite uh, simply. Uh, it shows um, the uh, species um, in the United States that have been introduced, three of them from Eurasia, one from Western North America, one from Eastern North America, one that is present uh, circumpolar, and then the rest, about 12 or so species, all introduced from Eastern North America into, North, uh, into Western North America. So we have homogenization occurring in uh, United States um, basins, but with a tendency of m a lot more, many more species being introduced from Eastern North America into, into Western North America. And the main reason for, for this observing this pattern has to do with, uh, with the uh, Western um, movement of people, so uh, European uh, colonizers, if I can, I don't know, I never know what's the politically correct word to use, but uh, with um, exploring, with the uh, Westerners exploring uh, United States, what they observed was that uh, certain uh, fish species that were present in eastern United States were not present in western United States in the basins, so it, they thought it was a great idea to enhance those basins in western United States, mainly for the purpose of uh, you know, food resource, for fishing. Uh, um, so that has, that's one of the reasons we see so many of the eastern North American species being introduced into uh, North America. And if you're interested, uh, there's this, th these data are taken out of this uh, paper. Now what this study did was to compare all possible pairs of states in the United States. So two states, they compare, this, uh, the researchers compared the number of species, fish species present now, versus the number of species present historically. And then out of all, uh, over a thousand comparisons, I guess, uh, pairs possible between uh, all United States, all states of the United States, uh, the researchers found 89 pairs uh, of states that had no species in common uh, in the past and now had a mean of 25.2 uh, species in common. So states that had nothing in common historically now have an, on, an average 25 species in common. So that's a great deal of biotic homogenization. States that, had, that were very distinct in terms of, of their um, fish diversity, now they are they have 25 species in common. And then one crazy example here, one extreme example here is Arizona and Montana had zero species in common and now have 33 species in common. If you know anything about the geography of, uh, biogeography, let's say, of, of North America, you know that Arizona and Montana are very, very different. Arizona is a dry state, um, high desert, uh, mostly high desert state, whereas Montana has, um, 
forest. Uh, forest has high altitude, uh, cool places. So uh, no wonder initially they had zero species in common. They are far away. <laughs> uh, they are far apart, geographically speaking. And now with these introductions that we've uh, facilitated, they have 33 species in common.